congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, do you believe in miracles? Maybe it's a question you've asked or, or been asked, even you know, not just in the Christian context, but even more broadly. I think it's one of those questions that even in our own kind of secular uh, day is still you know, somewhat acceptable. It's still kind of fodder for, for just general conversation. It, it's kind of on par with, you know, do you believe in ghosts or, or you know, do you believe in you know, the, the spiritual realm? It's kind of one of those types of questions. It, it's, you know, in our day, you know, there's a kind of this general spirituality that that reigns even with people who don't profess Christianity or any religion for that matter. I mean, even if you look at our popular songs and, and popular you know, writings, miracles abound. You know, this week as I was preparing for this sermon, I had an earworm all week. It was a, a song from my childhood, a, a famous duet by Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston from the movie The Prince of Egypt. And you know, they, they affirm the, the belief in miracles in our culture. They say, there can be miracles when you believe. Though hope is frail, it's hard to kill. Who knows what miracles you can achieve? When you believe, somehow you will. You will when you believe. So I think, again, it's kind of a highlights, kind of a general, you know, belief in it, kind of a shallowness, of course, this general belief. If you have enough conviction, you know, uh, miraculous, wonderful things will happen in your life. And yet, of course, there's a, a deeper question here or a deeper importance to this question, you know, how we answer this. Uh, even in our own tradition, our own history, you know, this was an important question. Uh, if you look back at the forming of even the OPC, you know, the, the question of miracles was was important, whether or not you affirmed the not just miracles in a general sense in the world around us, but the, the miracles that Scripture so clearly uh, conveys to us, even the ones we just read this morning. You know, this was in part what precipitated our break from the main line, this aff affirmation, the miracles of Scripture are true. They are to be believed. And, and yet, for as you know, important even for us as that question is, I think there's a deeper question we need to consider. If we stop there, do you believe yes or no? Okay, that's the end of the matter. I think that's not good enough. The more important question we should consider when we're thinking about miracles is, if we affirm them, what are miracles actually for? Why do we even have miracles in the first place, when we come to a text like this, what is Jesus doing? What is he up to as he performs these two wondrous works, one for this crowd and one for his own disciples? Why do the gospel writers feel it necessary to include so many of Jesus's mir miraculous signs, th these, these testimonies, as John refers to them uh, throughout his gospel? And as he does so, as John records these two for us, uh, amongst others, you know, the, the thing that they are given for the reason why there are miracles is, I mean, in part, they reveal something about ourselves. We, we will see ourselves, I think, in you know, these characters and in the crowd that Jesus deals with and the disciples. But, uh, of course, more importantly, these miracles reveal something to us about who Jesus is. They reveal what Jesus is doing in the world, not just that he can do miracles or that they're possible. So this morning, I want us to consider what these miracles, the, the walking on the water, and then before that, the feeding of the 5,000, what these reveal about our Savior. And first, as we consider the feeding of the 5,000, the first thing I want us to see is that the miracles reveal that Jesus alone can satisfy, that Jesus alone can satisfy. So as we come to this you know, text, Jesus has been traveling. He just comes from Jerusalem in chapter 5. He's had this second major dispute with the religious leaders, and now he, he returns to his own country, to the region of the Sea of Galilee, now being on the far side of the lake. And we see, of course, in addition to this, that you know, he's being followed. There's these crowds coming after him, perhaps all the way from Jerusalem, that they have been following him. They've been seeing the signs he's been doing on the sick, and they are interested. They're intrigued by his, his power. And you know, as John comes to this, he also frames for us what's happening here by telling us when it's happening. The, he says, now the, the, the feast of the Passover was at hand. It was about to take place. This is important. John will continually frame what Jesus is doing around these various Jewish holidays, uh, the, the Jewish religious calendar. So there's this thematic connection that John is setting up, something to do with, you know, the Passover. We want to have the, the Exodus and the Passover, that, that important event for God's people in mind. And, and even as we come to this scene, you know, we are reminded of that very event, this, this mass of people being brought out into the, 
wilderness, just like God's people as they come out in the Old Testament, these people clearly are, are hungry. So much so, Jesus says, you know, what are we going to do? Where are we going to find bread to feed these thousands and thousands of people? There's this exchange, you know, he asks his disciples, you know, what are we going to do? You figure it out. But of course, he knows what he's going to do. And then he performs this amazing feat. He takes this simple meal of five barley loaves and these two fish. And we're told he, he takes them, he blesses them, he, he breaks them, and then he distributes them. Somehow, you know, if we don't know how, what the mechanics of it were, but he feeds over 5,000 people. You know, some think it could be upwards of 15,000, 20,000 people here beyond just the men that are listed. And so we come to this miracle again, as I mentioned, you know, this miracle reveals to us, it tells us something about who Jesus is. And I mean, very simply, at least at you know, first glance, what is it that this shows us about Jesus? Well, and it shows us that he is powerful, the very fact that he can do this. None of us, you know, if we tried, if we even came together and, you know, put all of our endeavors, all of our efforts, we could not uh, replicate what Jesus does here with this simple act. In addition to this, you know, thinking thematically what Jesus is doing, of course, we're reminded of the great event of the Exodus and how God did very similarly what Jesus is doing now. God, for 40 years, he miraculously provided bread, uh, this manna from heaven for his people, this, you know, bread falling in the midst of this wilderness that was desolate, that had no food to offer them. And yet here we see Jesus is doing something similar, but actually something even greater than the miracle that it takes place in the Old Testament. Jesus very clearly is showing that he's greater than Moses, the one who led them out of Egypt, the one who, uh, you know, led them into the promised land. And yet, Jesus himself, you know, Moses was kind of the mediator. Moses was the one who prayed on their behalf, but Moses didn't make any bread. And yet Jesus here takes the bread. He makes it himself. He distributes the bread to his people. This, you know, sign that Jesus is, is indicating, he'll indicate in other ways, but, you know, I'm greater than that Old Testament uh, person. Moses, I can do these things on my own accord. I can make the bread myself. And in addition to this, even the effect of the meal is greater than what the Old Testament saints experienced. You know, they were told that they would go out, they would gather their manna for the, the day, and we we're told if someone had a, a little less than they should have gotten, they would be all right. If they got a little bit more, then they would be, you know, satiated, but that's it. There was this kind of general, you know, you get your fill and that's the end, and yet we see Jesus does something even better. He, we we're told he he satisfies the people that you know, the people basically, it's this image, you know, they're, they're sprawled out on the grass and they're stuffed. They cannot eat anymore. And there's even leftovers, we we're told, 12 baskets full of broken pieces that the people just couldn't touch because they were so satisfied. And there we see this, this deeper meaning. Jesus is powerful. He can do this, but very truly, Jesus is teaching that he and, and he alone is the one who satisfies, that Jesus is the one who can provide what we need to uh, fill us to, to satisfy our appetites. And it's not just this miracle that proves this, but you know, this miracle demonstrates kind of a, a general truth that we all are aware of, or at least we should you know, be tuned into that we have to acknowledge where our sustenance comes from. I mean, we live in a, a day and age where we're very disconnected from our food supply. You know, we go to the pantry and we have food to, you know, to satisfy us. We go to the grocery store, we can buy what we need. And so we often forget this very real, uh, this reality that, you know, we are in need. We are in need for someone else to provide our food. You know, we, as Christians, we pray, we're called to pray that God would give us our daily bread to not forget that it is God who supplies all that we need. It's this you know, principle of uh, dependence. Jesus, in, in some ways, is kind of just heightening or even fast-forwarding what is true in our everyday experience. You know, even if we don't miraculously get our bread, we have to go through the process of planting the seeds and hoping that God brings a crop, that he, you know, provides the right weather so that our crops will grow. And then, you know, a few months, weeks later, we have our food that we depend upon. And yet here, Jesus does it in an instant. Again, we're called to pray, give us, Lord, this day, give us what we need, give us our daily bread. Even 
going into this account or this miracle, you know, the, the question that Jesus asked, the way Jesus himself frames this miracle really touches on this truth that Jesus satisfies. Uh, Jesus, we don't, we don't know why exactly he singled out Philip, but he goes to Philip and he asks him, you know, Philip, where are we going to get bread? Where are we going to find enough food for all of these people? We're told this was done, not so that Philip would give a right answer, but to test him, or at least to see what his answer would be, which you know, maybe sounds a little malicious, maybe a little harsh to us. Why is Jesus putting Philip to the, to the test here? But of course, this question is supposed to push, to, to, to show Philip, to cause him to ask, to, to ask that question, where do we get our bread? Where do we get our provision? I mean, note, note the irony here is Philip's trying to figure out, you know, maybe you know, if, even if we got all of our resources, even if we collected as much money as we could, you know, 200 denarii, we couldn't feed everybody. Yet look who he's standing next to as he is trying to figure these things out. Who's asking him the, the question? I mean, we know John, the apostle who wrote this, you know, from the very beginning, he calls him the, the one through whom all things were created. The one who upholds the universe is standing right next to Philip and asking him, where are we going to get bread, Philip? How are we going to feed these people? Or again, in the context of the Exodus, the, the very one who sent manna for 40 years to, to feed his covenant people, asking Philip, where are we going to get bread? What possible source could we go to? The question, of course, is, is a question meant to call upon Philip's faith, to show him his reliance. Who is he trusting in his resources, you know, his ability to, to get bread, or the, the one, the one standing next to him who provides? And then there's this you know, little detail that this child has these five loaves, these two fishes, and you know, much is made of the, the child's gift, I think maybe sometimes a little bit too much, that it's all about, you know, we have this little thing to offer, and Jesus will multiply it, and certainly if Jesus doesn't multiply it, nothing will happen, but the, the point is, unless God does something, unless Jesus does something, the, the resources that the disciples have can't feed uh, this one little meal from this little child, it certainly can't feed the, the multitudes. The, the point is, unless Jesus acts here, nothing is going to happen. These people will surely starve. So we hear that question as we think about this event, I mean, you know, how many times in, in our own lives have, has that question been put before us? You know, not Jesus himself coming to us, asking us what, his, you know, what we should do, but, you know, situationally, providentially, Jesus brings us so often to, to situations like this. You know, he asks us that question in a sense, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to get through this situation? What possible resources do you have to rely upon? I mean, how quickly, you know, we run to the budget, you know, we see if we can scrounge a little bit more from one category, or, you know, maybe we can work a little harder, maybe we can do something, but, you know, so often we know, you know, the, the, the budget just doesn't match at the end of the month. We don't have enough to fulfill those things that we so desperately need often. And the point being, and even in our own lives, Jesus alone, Jesus is the one who can satisfy. And he does, Jesus does. He, he feeds the, these hungry people, these thousands and thousands. And we see as this happens, you know, the, the result, the, the reaction from the crowd is, is telling. They see something is happening here. They are clued into what Jesus is up to, at least in, in part, we're told they see this miracle and they, they get it. They understand. They say, surely this is the prophet. This is the prophet who is to come into the world. Even here, they seem to see this connection with Exodus and with, with Moses. And Moses himself said, you know, one day a prophet is going to arise like me. This, this true, this final prophet, he's going to be like me, but, but greater. So they say, this is the one. He's finally come and they... You know, connect the dots. Hey, he's this this prophet figure, this kind of this messianic expectation of this one, and they come and try and make him king by force. They try and establish him as their king right away. And yet, as they try to do so, you know, Jesus, to their eyes, strangely rejects it. He he flees from them. He runs away. He escapes their attempts to forcefully make him king. And we want to ask. Why? It seems like they understand to an extent what Jesus is doing. Yet it seems also that their view of him, 
based on Jesus's actions is, is, is quite insufficient. There's something lacking in what they perceive that he's up to. I mean, in short, you know, Jesus will even take them to task in the remainder of this chapter in some ways, but and what are they seeing him as? They are seeing him simply as that one who can supply their physical needs. You know, Jesus is able to give them bread, so let's follow him. Let's make him king. Let's make sure we always have this one who's going to sustain us. Or, you know, militarily, uh, politically, okay, he has this power. You know, he's this messianic figure. Okay, great, let's make him king, and he can also deal with that problem of the, the Romans who are oppressing us. Great, let's have him take care of all of our issues, all of our problems, which I means in part what Jesus came to do to, to, you know, deliver us from the things or to, to bring about the things that we lack. But, you know, in a sense, they've, they've truncated the gospel. They've left out a significant part of it. You could say maybe in our modern parlance, the way the gospel is often present, uh, presented in our own day, it's, you know, this story, this account that Jesus simply came to make your life better, that Jesus simply came to satisfy your physical needs, that your life is okay, and maybe there's some lacking, and Jesus came to simply supplement that, to improve the quality of your life, and certainly Jesus does improve the quality of our life, but of course that's only half the story. If we miss what else Jesus is up to, we miss the whole thing, that, you know, that is a fruit, that is a result of what Jesus truly came to do for us, and they miss. They don't recognize the extent of that, and so Jesus goes from the crowds, he departs, he has some time by himself. Then we are now presented, John goes on right away to present us with this second miracle, which reveals to us not only does Jesus come to to satisfy, but secondly this morning, Jesus comes to save his people. He comes to save. Again, Jesus goes away from the crowds. He, He goes off by himself as he so often does perhaps to pray, perhaps to, to kind of just you know, get away from the crowds. And, and then we see his disciples, they, uh, based on the other gospels, they are told, Jesus says, go along without me, you know, go cross the, the sea, which, I mean, these were seasoned fishermen, but Jesus is telling them, go in the middle of the night, go on this storm-tossed sea in the middle of this, you know, dark sea in the, or this dark night and, you know, go to the other side, wait for me, I'll, I'll come and meet you. They're rowing. We're told they go about three, four miles. They're you know in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, rowing as hard as they possibly can. Nothing is happening. They can't get any farther. And then the miracle happens, the second miracle. Jesus comes to them walking on the, the stormy waves of the sea. And again, like the, the, the first miracle, we can get caught up in the how. You know, did he make the water hard? Did he you know, el- uh, levitate himself? How did he do this thing? We don't know. We're not told. Uh, but again, why? Why did Jesus do this? Why did he choose to reveal himself in this uh, miraculous way? And again, he is revealing something. He's showing he has, again, the power to walk on the very waves of the sea, to to manipulate you know, time and space it, itself, and to you know, uh, control, to even uh, you know, go up against the very order of the universe he created. This one who has all authority over all of creation, who will you know, silence the waves, who will walk upon the water. And yet even more than this, again, more than just demonstrating his power, the, the context of the miracle clues us in as to what, what Jesus is trying to show here. And to really understand what Jesus is showing, we have to understand kind of the, the theology of the sea, what the, what the sea often represents in Scripture, that the, the sea, that you know, the, the waters, these deep, dark waters were, you know, uh, thematically tied to a lot of things in the Old Testament. That, of course, even as we often think of the sea, it's this scary place. It's this chaotic place, this place that we can't control, you know, that we don't want to be dropped into the middle of, this overwhelming force. In addition to this, you know, the sea was the, the abode of the, the you know, ancient uh, sea serpent, the Leviathan, kind of the you know, the, the enemy, the, this, this being, this creature that had to be defeated, that was always trying to, to kill God's people. And of course, the sea so often, the, the waters are often connected in the Old Testament with the idea of, of sin and in the picture of, of judgment. You know, think of the, the flood, the flood waters. They were this picture as the whole world is covered in the sea, essentially. You know, it's this 
picture of God's judgment, pouring out his judgment upon the whole earth. Often the sea is connected to the, the place of the dead, to Sheol. And, you know, to go down into the sea was to die, was to be consumed, to go to the grave. Even in, again, the context of the Passover meal of the Exodus story, you know, think of that powerful image. You have the people they've been, you know, delivered. Uh, Pharaoh has said, has said, go, you know, go to your, uh, you know, your native land, you know, leave me finally. And then there's this scene, you know, you have the, the, the Red Sea on one side of the people and you have Pharaoh's armies on the other side. On the one side, you have slavery, you have their old life that they're trying to flee from. You have death on the other side, sure and certain death if they move forward. Just like Israel, you know, the disciples are in a very similar situation. They're, they're stuck. They're unable to do anything. They cannot save themselves. We too, I mean, this is a picture of you know, our existence. If this is a, you know, supposed to be significant for us, you know, we too, in our own lives, we cannot save ourselves. We are unable to do anything unless God steps in unless he, he intervenes in our lives. This is the, you know, the point in the, in the sermon where I say, okay, what are the storms of your life? Let's, let's think about that. But of course, you know, this is reflective. This is just you know, a, a microcosm of the fact that we face sin and death, that we struggle with sin, that we face judgment, that you know, we are uh, at war, that there is an enemy out to get us. That's all contained in this little picture we have. And yet in the midst of this, as the disciples know, God doesn't come if we, you know, as hard as we can row, we know we're going to be swallowed up here. And then Jesus comes, he walks upon the sea. And even here, there's this picture throughout the Old Testament of, of God as this one who has the power to walk upon the sea. This one who has control even over the, you know, the, the sea serpent over death itself. Uh, you know, the, there's this picture in Job and in, in the Psalms of God as this one who is able to trample the sea, to walk upon it for the redemption of his people. This one who even has the power over death and the devil. Jesus is very clearly uh, you know, showing himself to be that one here. And then with that act, this amazing, powerful act of him walking on the sea, he gives, you know, very simply, but this, this beautiful word, this statement, this, this message to his disciples, this, you know, wonderful line, it is I, do not be afraid, he tells them. He doesn't just show them how powerful he is, he tells them, it's me, don't worry, do not be afraid. And it, even that phrase, even what Jesus tells them, it's more than just, hey, it's me, it's Jesus, you know who I am, you know, I'm not a ghost. But he's claiming something more about himself, he is and taking upon himself tr truly the, the divine name here. When he says, it is me, it is I, he will say those very words a couple chapters later. He'll be again fighting with the religious leaders and he'll say, before Abraham was, I am. And he's very clearly taking to himself the, the name of Yahweh, the, the God of the covenant. Here he's saying, I am, it's me, it's the Lord, I am here. Therefore, do not be afraid. This is his, again, his covenant name, this name he revealed to Israel as he was about to redeem them from Egypt. He tells them, you go, Moses, tell them that I am is the one who sent you. So as we see this powerful act, you know, what I want us to see, it's not just Jesus showing how powerful he is. It's certainly that, but more than that, it's him showing that that power is directed towards something, that that, that that power is directed very specifically towards the redemption of his people. And again, he adds to that, you know, the, these comforting words, do not be afraid. Here, echoing the words we read from, from Isaiah 43, fear not, I am the Lord, I am with you, do not fear, fear not. Jesus is saying, again, taking on the words of the Lord himself, because I am here, because I am the Lord, you do not have to be afraid. These words given in Isaiah, you know, promising salvation, promising redemption, Jesus is taking those very same words upon his lips. And it's a word to us. It's a promise to us, not just, you know, in Isaiah's day, not just in Jesus's day, but you know, Jesus declaring to his people, I am that 
I am the Lord, that you do not have to be afraid in the midst of our own fear, our own struggle with sin, our own guilt, our own trials of this life. Jesus tells us, you do not have to be afraid. Why? Because I am with you. Or you know, think of Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, David will declare. And that's you know, really that, that promise, hearing that promise, believing that promise is really the, the, the challenge for us to believe that Jesus is who he says that he is. And, and that really takes us you know, back to that, that question of, of miracles. You know, do we believe in, in miracles? Do we believe that Jesus is able to do what he says he can do? I mean, part of the reason we ask that question, part of the reason maybe we even struggle with that question is because we, we don't see miracles, that you know, this isn't our everyday experience, Jesus walking on the sea, Jesus feeding the 5,000. We, we didn't see those things. We have to take them by faith. I mean, if you asked a disciple, you know, do you believe in miracles? He could say, yeah, I just saw Jesus walk on the sea. Or you know, if you asked a Jew, yeah, I just saw Jesus duplicate all these loaves. But you know, for us, we don't see that. It's a, it's a struggle for us to trust in that often or again to you know to, to draw upon the words of Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston you know they don't always or they don't always happen when you ask and it's easy to give in to your fears but when you're blinded by your pain you can't see the way you can't see the way to get through the rain a small but still pers- uh, resilient voice says help is very near which I don't know whose voice they're talking about it's kind of sounds like your own internal kind of fortitude but you know, there is a voice, there is one near to us who says he is able to do what he says he can do. And even in these miracles, Jesus is telling us that he has come to do not just these things, but, but something greater. And that's as we conclude this morning, that's our, our last point I want us to consider. That is the greater miracle, the greater miracle that these miracles are, are pointing to. I mean, for as great and, and as glorious as these miracles are, they are not ends in and of themselves. As we see them, we might long, we might wish that God would still do stuff like this in our own day. And you know, certainly he, he does from time to time. He, he provides for us in ways we would call miraculous. You know, we have experiences of God just providing in ways we can't explain or, or you know, saving us, healing us from things we can't explain. And we we give praise to God, but that's not our everyday experience, certainly. And even if it was, even if you know you woke up tomorrow and your your pantry was was full, even though your bank account wasn't, even if your four hundred one k was fully funded for your retirement, even if Jesus you know physically came to you and said, "Don't worry, I'm with you in this hardship." I mean, even if we were delivered from our our most pressing danger, the thing that just consumes our thoughts, that concern that we just can't shake, you know, that wouldn't be. Uh, enough for us. We, we need something more. And again, these miracles were intended to point us to that something more, that work that Jesus was up to in the world. They point to something greater. And what is that greater miracle? What is that thing that these miracles were simply signposts to? Well, John will say, you know, he'll repeat that there were these signs that Jesus kept doing that reveal his, his glory, that there were these witnesses to who Jesus was. But you know, there's this refrain over and over that there was this greater event, that this glory, that, that Jesus would glorify himself one day in his ministry, that, you know, he would be the sign. And he even says, you know, that he was going to be lifted up so that all men would see who God was, what God's character was. And in short, you know, what is the greater miracle? What is all this pointing to? Well, it's, it's the cross, cross is what testifies to us that Jesus is who he says he was, that he is able to do what he promises. You know, thinking in terms of our need for satisfaction, Jesus comes not to sh- just to satisfy us with, with fish and loaves, but he comes to, to give himself as bread, as he comes to the cross, as his body is, is broken for, for sinners his blood is poured out, and it's not just satisfying us, but you know, in that act, he, he satisfies the, the very justice of God so that we might be reconciled to God. For at the cross, he, he comes to, to conquer those enemies that 
beset us, our greatest enemies, sin and, and death and the devil. Jesus doesn't just you know trample on the waves of the sea, but he tramples on the head of the serpent. Not by coming as a mighty military leader as the people were hoping, but I mean truly by himself, allowing himself to be swallowed up by death, to be swallowed up by the baptism of judgment, by undergoing those judgment waters that you know, we deserved. And as he does so, he declares at the end of John's gospel, he says, it is finished. I have accomplished all that is necessary, in other words. And then he miraculously, by the power of you know, his own life, he is raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's, he's raised in, in power. He's raised in victory, we see. So as we conclude this morning, you know, as much as we would like to see miracles on, on a day-to-day basis, as cool as that would be, as maybe encouraging for our faith, brothers and sisters, you know, every week, truly, we get to experience something far superior than what these disciples or, or what these followers of Jesus got to experience. I mean, not just a thousand or a few thousand people being fed by the Sea of Galilee, but I mean, every week, even now, we are fed, we are sustained. Jesus comes to us. He nourishes us, not you know, so that our bellies are simply full with, with bread, but true satisfaction. He comes to us meeting our deepest need week after week. In word and sacrament, our, our baptism, you know, this picture of the fact that Jesus took those judgment waters for us, that we have passed through that judgment, we have been cleansed, we have been made alive at Christ, brought into safety, we've been brought to that other shore, in other words. In supper, Jesus feeding us, again, not with physical elements merely, but with his own flesh and blood. And in his word, preach week after week, Jesus declaring to us, Time and time again, I am your God. I will be with you. Do not be afraid. Brothers and sisters, as you look to Christ this morning, you can trust, you can know that he will and he has satisfied you and that he will bring all of us safely to our heavenly home. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray.